Now, at this point in the conference, I know what happens, that the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. <laughs> we had a great night of worship last night, and you've had two full days where we've just been pouring on the fire hydrant. Uh, but hang in with me, because we've got two more purposes, and, and then a, and a very important on how do you insert the purposes of God uh, into your church, how to lead your church through change, which is an extremely important a message that we're going to end up with. Now, we've already looked at uh, evangelism, and we've looked at worship, and we looked at fellowship. Uh, we've looked at discipleship. We've talked about moving people from the community to the crowd, which is the weekend service, from the crowd into the congregation, joining membership, becoming part of the fellowship, moving them from the fellowship into the committed to building mature disciples. And now we want to talk about moving people into ministry. We've moved them from membership to maturity to ministry. Now, as Tom said yesterday, you'll never be completely mature, but we are maturing through ministry. M maturity is never an end in itself. Maturity is for ministry and mission. And that's what we're going to do. Everybody needs a ministry in the church and a mission in the world. I'll say it again. Everybody needs, every believer needs a ministry in the church and a mission in the world. A ministry to believers and a mission to unbelievers. A ministry to the body of Christ and a mission to, uh, to the world. One day Napoleon pointed to a map of China and he, he looked at that and he said, it, that if that ever wakes up, it will shake the world. It will shake the world. And, and I feel the same way about the church that if the church ever wakes up, it will shake the world. Let me put this in perspective. There are about 600 million Buddhists in the world, 600 million. There are about 800 million um, Hindus in the world. There are about one and a half billion Muslims in the world. There are only about 15 million Jews because six million were killed in the Holocaust and just think of how many generations were lost in that. Um, but there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Now, they're not all your brand, they're not all my brand, but if you were to say to these 2.3 billion Christians, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as Trinity, triune God? Yes. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Yes. Do you believe Christ died on the cross? Yes. Do you believe he rose again on Easter? Yes. Do you believe he's coming again? Yes. Then we're on the same team. Okay, we may not agree on all the other, but we're all, you're certainly not a Muslim, you're certainly not something else, you are a believer. That means one out of every three people on the planet is a Christian, 2.3 billion. The church is the largest organization in the world. Nothing comes close to the church. The church is bigger than China. The church is bigger than India. The church is bigger than the China and the United States and all of Europe put together. Nothing is a big. You never apologize for being a part of the church of God. We have hundreds of millions of more volunteers. Our army of love is bigger than all the other armies put together. Nothing comes close. One out of every three people on this planet is a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe not a good one, but they're a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right? Now, if it wakes up, could you imagine if we mobilized just a percentage of those people for ministry? What would happen uh, in the world? The greatest need, I believe, in the church today is to empower every member for ministers, for ministry. And what I want to talk to you in this lecture about, with Keith's going to help me, is um, how do you turn an audience into an army? How do you turn consumers who are sitting in your chairs into contributors? How do you turn passive spectators in your church into participators? Would you be interested in that? Yeah, okay. Most churches say, probably almost every church say, we believe in the ministry of every believer. They may even teach it. But most members in most churches still do absolutely nothing except come and sit and soak and sour. So how do you turn an audience into an army? Our most important resource in the body of Christ is, is people. And what scares me, I, I believe obviously in large churches, I pastor one. But there's a lot, some things I don't like about big churches. 
And one of the things I don't like about big churches is that the larger the church is, it is easier for talent to hide. Because you don't know it's there. And the bigger the crowd gets, uh, there's so many times I've walked out onto the patio and I, I've said, so we need this. They go, why don't you get him or her? They go, what do you do? I remember one time we were going to do it. We were going to cancel a weekend service and we were going to throw a party for the community. We called it Summer's End. I just made up a holiday. And it was, a, it was at the end of the summer and we said, we're going we're gonna to fill this 120 acres with a big party for the community just to kind of build a bridge event. And I said, I, I, I need some party planners. And I, I, I turned around and they said, why don't you get her? And I said, what do you do? She goes, well, I plan all the parties for Disneyland. So I, we announced it and said, if you have background in party planning, show up. And we sat down and there were 18 people in the room. I said, what do you do? He said, well, we're in charge of the Dick Clark ball drop in Times Square every year. <laughs> That's a party. Uh, 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 and another one did Disneyland. And another one goes, well, I'm not a party planner. But he says, I own a bus company. I could give you 27 buses to transport people back and forth. Uh, and it, it, you have to ask. You have not because you asked not, but you don't know the talent. See, I don't know that talent was there. The larger the crowd is easier for, for talent to hide. And the problem with that is that talent that sits on the shelf rots. You don't use it, you lose it. Many years ago, the famous pollster, George Gallup, did a poll in the United States and of churches. And he discovered you might write this down, only 10% of all members, all laymen, laywomen, only 10% of all members of a church are actively involved in a ministry. They're actively serving in some way. One out of every 10 people in your church is probably serving in some way. He also discovered that an additional 50% said, I have no interest at all in serving. 50% of the members of, of the typical church said, I'm not interested in doing any area of service. They're going to remain spectators no matter what you say. Those are the people when you ask them to serve, they say, oh, pastor, I just don't feel led. I go, oh, you feel led all right. It's led in the seat of your pants. Okay. <laughs> you, I don't feel led. Yeah, oh, yeah, you've you're got a lead bottom is what you got. So, uh, and, 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 but... Gallup discovered, write this down, 40% of the typical church said they would like to be involved in service, but they've never been asked or they don't know how. 40% of the people in your church said, I would be involved in service, but I've never been asked or I don't know how. Now, if I showed you a way to turn that 10% of your people who are involved in ministry and add 40% more so half of your church was involved in ministry, would you be interested? Yeah, I think I'd died and gone to heaven. Okay, if I got half of all the church involved in, in, in a ministry. So that's what we're gonna look at this morning. Now to start, you have to begin with the biblical basis. And I'm gonna ask uh, Keith Loy in just a second to come out here. Keith is an amazing guy. And I'm not gonna tell a story because I want him to tell it. You know, normally when you think of a large church, you think of a large city. You don't normally think of cities like Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But Keith started to celebrate church there in Sioux Falls about 20 years ago, and 13,000 people have come to Christ in that town. Okay, this is not like New York City. This is not Los Angeles, this is not Dallas, this is not the Bible Belt. This is Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 13,000 came to Christ. Let's give him a warm welcome, Keith Loy. All right, buddy. I want you to repeat after me if you would. This stuff works. Say it with me. This stuff works. It was in 1998 that I came to California for the first time in my life. And I discovered for the first time that hell is for real. Um, <laughs> it was the first time I ever drove on an LA, LA freeway. And uh, it was that moment that I learned why Rick came here. Um, I, uh, I also learned something in that moment that God is never finished. And God is doing things supernaturally that we can't even begin to understand. True story. Again, I've never been to California, I was here by myself. I was a young kid. 
and came out to the Purpose Driven Conference as a part of a classwork that I was doing up in Canada when I was in school. And I came out here and I spent the first session just weeping. I grew up in the church. Both my grandfathers were pastors. My dad is a pastor. And I grew up just, just a part of a traditional church. In no negative sense do I say that. I just had no idea what the church could be and even beyond what I grew up in. And so I sat in the first session, I just wept. I mean, I just wept. And I spent that day contemplating, had no idea that God was calling me to be a pastor myself. I was doing youth work, and I sat right over there, and I just wept. Literally true story. I get to my motel room that night, and a man calls me just out of the blue, said he'd heard about me and was wondering if I'd plan a church for him. That happened in California, first time I've ever been here, the first night at the Purpose Driven Conference. And I knew that God was doing something within me because as I sat and just listened to what Rick shared. And no kidding, he called me and said, I want you to plant a church. And this fall we'll celebrate 20 years at that church in which he reached out and asked if I'd preach at. It's such a cool story. Folks, I say it again, this stuff works. And, and not knowing anything about being a pastor, I took Rick at his word, and I literally took everything, everything that he gave us, and I just stole it. I even, I even took his messages. And it wasn't hard for me to, 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 to personalize them, because my wife's name is Kay, too. And so... <laughs> and so I literally just took it, and God began to grow a family. But what we're talking about here, to me, all of the purposes are absolutely essential. But to me, this is the epicenter. To me, this is what it's all about. And, and here's what I've discovered in the church. People want to live and lead and love and be a part of what I get to do. We all talk about being called of God, and I just want to say this real quickly. Too often, and, and please don't take this wrong, but I think we side on God's call to our lives, and we forget that so many times, I think the way that God really calls us is he works through other people. I'm doing what I am today because people believed in me, people encouraged me, people mentored me, people poured into me. And I stop and think about, what if I took that same, that same pouring into that people poured into me, and I started believing that all of the people in the congregation which I've pastored need to be poured into the same. And so right now, just so you know, we're into really a big deal of planting churches. We've always raised our staff from within the church. And uh, a few years ago, God shared in my heart, he said, listen, you raised them up to build your church. Now I want you to let them go to build my kingdom. And so we began to plant churches. And in the last three years, we've planted 13. And the next year, we're getting ready to plant 10 more. And we have 80 people in our congregation who want to be a part of planting a church. Folks, they're setting in your church. And they want to do what you get to do. And so I don't say this with any disrespect or put anybody on the defense, but sometimes I think we need to get over ourselves and get under God and let God begin to do something that's unbelievable in our churches. Amen? And so this stuff works. It works. And so I want you to write this down. If you've got notes, take them out. The first thing we need to do is we need to teach the biblical basis for volunteer ministry. We need to teach the biblical basis. And if you look in Romans, and you look in chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, there are four pillars to this volunteer ministry. Four pillars that need to be taught, biblically taught. And here's the first. You have to believe that every believer is a minister. You have to believe it. You can't just say this. I think a lot of churches actually say they believe this, but their behavior doesn't model it. You have to believe that every believer is a minister. Romans 12, 4 says, just as we have many members, they all do not have the same function. But here's the deal. They do have a function. And they want to do it. You just got to believe in them. You know, when we first launched, I got to tell you, I was like a lot of pastors. I was just so grateful for a warm body when they came through the door. Anybody ever feel like that? And then I had this other thought. I just want them to come back. But that was wrong thinking. There's something that I subscribe to, and it came early 
20 years ago when we began to launch this church. And here's what it was. Everything you need to get to where God wants you to go, you already have. Everything you need where God wants you, by the way, it's his bride. Everything you need where God wants you to go, you already have. And so in the early days, it didn't take me long to start realizing when someone came through the door, it wasn't so much that I looked at them hoping they would come back. I began to look at them and say, that's our future children's pastor. They don't know it yet, but God knows it. See, God isn't going to bring people into the doors of your church just to get them saved. There's kingdom work to be done. And your church, your church was the key. And so God brought them through your door. And we have this incredible privilege and honor to raise them up and to watch what God can do when God gets a hold of them. Everything you need, you already have. Everything you need, you've got to believe that. You've got to believe it. Let me tell you a quick story about Kurt and Devona Whitrock. When they came, there were three people, when they came through the doors of our church, they didn't like. I was one of them. They came because their children had come, and their children both found Christ. This was a drinking couple, a party couple. Like to play the world in a very deep way, but when they came, they thought I was too kind. And yet the other two people, I think, are amazingly kind, and they didn't like them either. But they told each other, if you go, I'll go, and they kind of made a bet. And the one didn't want to go, and that was his wife. And so next week, she said, now we're going back because after I went, I really want to go back again. He didn't want to go, but they came, and they both got saved. And our entire facilities and all of the things that we do outside the church when it comes to the physical property of the church, he's on our full-time team today. And what's even cooler is now that God is beginning to work on his heart, he wants to go out and plant one of our churches. And so everything you need, you already have. You've got to believe that. Folks, listen, being a minister is not a profession. It's what it means to be one of God's people. Being a minister is not a profession. It's what it means to be one of God's people. As Kay Warren likes to say, when you give your life to Christ, you put on an apron because you begin to serve that moment forward. And I love that stuff. What does the Bible say in 2 Timothy? It is he who saved us and chose us, chose us all for his holy work. Every believer is a minister. Here's the second pillar. Every minister is important. Every minister is is important. We know the words of Paul. The hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. The ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you. Have you ever considered a foot? Did you know that 25% of our body's bones are in our feet? And there contains actually three arches to bear not only the strong loads, but absorb the shocks as those loads change from time to time. And yet we don't give them much thought until you stub a toe in the morning. It's interesting, isn't it? We blink over four million times a year to irrigate our eyes. And our retinas are considered the most complex tissue in the entire human body, but we don't give them much thought until you get an eyelash in there. And what about our teeth? They can exert 200 pounds of pressure in just one bite, but we don't think much about it until one of them gets a cavity. The Bible says what? Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. As Francis Schaeffer says in his book, No Little People, we're all significant. Everybody matters. When's the last time you shared that with some of the people that serve in your church that you can quickly walk by and you forget how important they are? See, I, I don't... I don't cheapen God's call in my life, but I do everything I can to fuel the call in everybody else's. And I say it all the time within our services, around our services, I go around all the time and let everybody know, thank you for everything that you do. And sadly, I hear these words often, but pastor, I don't do something as important as you do. And I said, you're right, what you do is more important. Every, 
every minister is important. Here's the third pillar. We're all dependent on each other. Romans 12, 5 says we're all parts of God's one body. And each one of us belongs to each other. Would you look at someone right now and say, I belong to you? Come on. <laughs> now, now, now I want you to look at somebody you're not married to because they already know that. <laughs> but folks, consider. Consider a jigsaw puzzle. If one piece is missing, what piece do you notice? Folks, that's the way it's supposed to be in the church. Listen to this very carefully. We're not in the body of Jesus to compete with one another. We're in the body of Jesus to complete one another. Amen? Oh, my goodness. And contrary to what built this country, the Declaration of Independence, God builds his church by the Declaration of Interdependence. We need each other. Amen to that? We have a pastor who I met with coffee one time. He wasn't a pastor, and I asked him what his dream was, and he said he wanted to be a stay-at-home dad. See, I think the art of leadership is to learn to listen first. And the moment he said that, it kind of just tweaked my head. It's kind of a thing in our church that people know when I just twitch my head, I'm thinking, okay, something more is going on here. And he said, well, how would you like to be a stay-at-home dad in God's church and have more than just your own children, have a whole bunch of children? And he joined our team as a children's pastor during a time that we were launching campuses, and we no longer have campuses. We had seven. We closed every one of them. And the way we did that is we turned them into their own church. And now he has, if you will, his own church. He was a campus pastor, and he now pastors that church. It was a campus in one of our outlaying communities. And again, Sioux Falls isn't a large area. I always tell people it's kind of interesting to pastor a church that on the weekends, our church, our church alone, is the 16th largest city in the whole state. It's, it's, it's a small state. There's not a lot of people there. And uh, there's hardly anybody there since I'm here. But I... Uh, <laughs> But uh, which is really crazy about the, the L.A. freeway because usually about the largest of our states driving around you. It's just wild. But I, I, I remember talking to John one time. He now pastors this church, and it was running about 185 people. And we made it its own church because God laid something on my heart. He says, local communities need a local pastor. And so we, uh, we, we turned it into its own church, and it had 185 roughly, and now it runs over 500 and it's so awesome what John's done. But, but I talked to John one day, and he'd ran a marathon in Chicago and asked him what he'd learned after he completed it. And he said, if I did it again, listen to these words, I'd make sure I didn't run it alone. I know a lot of pastors who are tired. And uh, right now I'm actually on a sabbatical in Florida I flew out last night and will fly out back this afternoon to go back and be with my wife and our youngest child. And uh, we have three, three children. We have a 24-year-old, a 19-year-old, and an 8-year-old. <laughs> and uh, you get to my age, you're like, let's just have another one. What matters now? <laughs> and so, but, there, but, there's an, but, but there's an interesting thing when people go on a sabbatical too often. I think they go on to it with a different mindset. And I'm not actually on it to get rested I'm actually just on it to just get away and just spend time with my wife and continue to grow if you will in our relationship in our marriage and I, and I only say it because I know a lot of pastors are tired and a lot of reasons is because they're running the race alone I love the fact that when I really get to heaven part of that well done is won't be just how I ran but I think part of that well done is who I ran it with it is so much more fun to do ministry when you're running together. You know, there's an old Zambian proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. We need each other. Here's the fourth pillar. Ministry is the expression of my shape. It's the expression of my shape. And some of you probably know where I'm going with this. But I love what the Bible says in Job. Your hands, O oh God, formed me and they shaped me. Shape. Five letters that are key to making you who you are. You might want to write this down. Your shape determines your significance. Your shape determines 
your significance. And when you can fully identify that and embrace that, you'll discover the ministry you're going to have in and to the world. And that's true to your people as well. And so I want to give you these five letters real quickly. The S stands for spiritual gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of us has received a gift from God to use to serve others. Folks, the moment you become a believer, God gives you at least one gift. Amen to that? And the moment you became a believer, he didn't give you all of them. Amen to that? <laughs> I've met a few people who think he did. And uh, they're a joy, aren't they? But your spiritual gifts or gift is a part of your shape that determines your significance. The H is for heart. I don't know if you knew this or not, but every one of us has a unique physical heartbeat, just like a fingerprint. It's incredible. You have a unique heartbeat physically, but the same is true with your emotions. Everybody here has a passion. There's something that you get so excited about and you wonder why no one else does. That's your heart. You know, three years ago, we announced to our congregation that we were going to adopt 50 kids in 10 years. We just think that every child deserves a forever family. That's what we like to call it. Three ladies came forward, and that's the reason we announced it. Because they had this heart, this passion. They'd already adopted a child and felt like, my goodness, how many people are missing out? And it's crazy. In three years, it was a 10-year goal. And we'll surpass that. Because we're three years in and 30 children, 32 children now have been adopted by people within our church. I love it. So let me quickly give you a moment of caution, though. Just because it floats your boat doesn't mean you have to sink someone else's. And here's what I'm saying about that. Just because you're passionate about it doesn't mean everybody else has to be passionate about it. You with me on that? It's your shape. Part of that is your heart. Here's the A, abilities. Some of you are good with numbers. Some of you don't care. Some of you are good working with your hands. Some of you just need to keep sitting on them. Okay? <laughs> some of you are good with words, while some of us isn't. <laughs> okay? Some of you can sing. Some of you need to stop. You're what, you're what we like to call a prison singer. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, you're always behind a few bars, never have the right key. Okay. <laughs> you got that voice that needs to be cultivated, you know, like plowed under. <laughs> but, but abilities, abilities are necessary. They're necessary, just like a spiritual gift, and they're needed in the church. L let me give you an example. There's no spiritual gift of working with computers. I love having those people who get it, who know how they work. Don't you? See, those abilities are important. There's no spiritual gift of accounting. But I'm so grateful for Galen Enns, who leads that ministry. We need it in the church. Some of you have different abilities, but it's part of your shape that gives you significance. Here's the P, personality. Give me a show of hands real quick. How many are extroverted people? How many are introverted? I always know who they are because they're just like. <laughs> How many like routine? How many need variety? Absolutely. God wired us. He specifically wired us as part of our shape. Some of you are morning people. See, you don't have to raise your hand, okay? Because the ones that aren't, they're not here. They're still back at the motel, you know? But, but here's the great question. How many of you morning people married a night owl? See, don't you love God's sense of humor? He puts us together and then he watches the sparks fly. I just love that. But the moment I said I do with my personality, I inherited a whole bunch of I don'ts because of my wife's.
But here's the deal. If two people agree on everything, one of them isn't necessary. I don't know if you know this, by the way, but from the moment of birth, little girls have more lip and mouth movement than boys. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know that doesn't change as they get older? <laughs> In fact, Harvard did a study of 100 preschoolers and they found that 100% of the sounds coming from little girls' mouth were actually words. <laughs> Whereas only 60% of sounds coming from little boys were words like vroom, og, toot, toot. <laughs> Which, by the way, doesn't change as they get older. <laughs> and then there's the E experiences. And I want, you to, I want you to listen to this. I'm talking about all experiences as part of your shape. The good, the bad, the ugly. And some of you have been through some pretty painful, painful ones. But the Bible says what? God often, notice the word here, in 2 Corinthians 1, God often allows us to go through painful experiences. And he comforts us so that we in turn may comfort others with the comfort we have received. Mike and Peggy Nichols. I love Mike and Peggy. They've been a part of our church for quite some time. He plays in our worship ministry, our weekend music. And I remember when I got the phone call, I was actually on vacation. And the word came that their youngest child, Troy, had died. He was supposed to play golf with his dad that morning. And his dad, when he came home, found him. And Troy was gone. Talk about a painful experience. But today, Mike and Peggy, they now meet with unbelievable amounts of couples who have gone through the same tragic, painful experience. And I know this sounds kind of awkward and maybe strange to say it, but I will tell you how proud I am of them. To watch them walk with people in a moment where so many want to what? Push God away and blame him. Through their painful tragedy. And this is why I love being in the church. This is why what we're doing here is the most important thing we can do, folks. There's nothing more important than it. Because see, Mike and Peggy know Jesus and Troy knew Jesus and Troy's now with Jesus and they're going to get to be with Troy again. But during that gap, this side of heaven... They're walking with so many families and we're watching God begin to really begin healing of so many people's lives and more and more people are coming to Christ. See, it's part of their shape. And we work extremely hard, if you will, so hard in walking people through their shape and helping them understand it. And that brings me to the second thing that we need to do. We need to learn to establish a ministry placement process by helping people understand their shape. And so, I think every one, of the, every one of you should have one of these. Is that right? This should have been handed out to you. This is Saddleback's shape profile. Okay, I think you should be getting these. It's really good. But, but... I'm, I'm trusting if, if we're not going to be able to get them passed out, that, that maybe uh, we can get them in your hands as you're leaving out. But you need, you need to get your eyes on this. They actually have a lab for this, and you can get more information on this. But it's a profile that they have every person fill out that begins to walk in through the church and becomes a part, if you will, empowering that core. It's taught in their 301 class, and it's something that they take everybody through. And I want to quickly just take you through that in discovering your ministry, helping people learn what I just walked you through, their shape. Because when people discover their shape, they discover their significance. And I want to tell you, if you want to do what Pastor Rick just said, of taking that 40% that wants to be a part, that half your church, half your church would be a part of ministry, and serving. I'm telling you, you get 50% of people, you'll change your city you're in. 
And, and I'm experiencing that. I, don't, I say that incredibly humbly, but I'm experiencing that in so many ways when you allow the congregation to get to do what you do and to get to experience that incredible joy. I love the church. I love what I do. And I want everybody in the church to have that same heart and that same passion. And the key to that is helping them discover their shape. And so what you want to do is get this, and you train up people within your church who have that gift to walk people. You're intentionally helping them to be able to walk with others to help them discover their shape. And so they come to the Discovery Ministry class. We do this at Celebrate, the church I pastor. And they come, and we help them walk through and filling out this shape profile, and they learn all their things about who they are, their heart, their abilities, their personality, the experiences they have. We don't want to waste any of that. It's all a part of who they are. And then they complete this, they fill it out, and then they take it to a person who's been trained to walk with them through it. And what this person does, well then, in looking at it, they fill out the top, there's several copies to it, and they pass it through the ministries, and by looking at the shape, they begin to say, listen, here are three or four areas that you should take a look at. And we want to get people at our church involved in as quickly as we can. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But they meet with a supervised person, and then they begin to look at that, and then we get them in there. We get them involved in that ministry. Folks, you've got to be intentional about this stuff. And when you do, it begins to change everything. Pastor Rick's now going to come and walk you through number three. Great. Thank hey, Keith. Thanks, buddy. Great job. All right. So if you're going to mobilize your people for ministry, you got to first teach them, as what Keith just said, those four pillars of every member is a minister, every gift is important, there are no unimportant ministries, etc. Then you set up a pro profile. We actually have a, 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 I believe we've got a lab on this, on how to, how to move people into the steps of ministry. Here's step number three. Streamline your organizational structure to maximize ministry and minimize maintenance. Streamline your organization to maximize ministry and minimize maintenance. What I mean by that is to have more ministry, you're going to have to cut out more meetings. Most, people, most churches have too many meetings. And, and uh, Jesus did not say, I have come that you might have meetings. Okay? And, and when you look at the calendar of the typical Christian, it looks like the goal of the church is just to keep the saints busy. We have too many committees and not enough committed. Now, what's the difference between a ministry and a committee? Ministries meet needs. Committees talk about what they want other people to do. In this church, we have zero committees. We don't have a single committee in this church, but we have over 500 ministries. Committees talk about what they want other people to do. Ministries just do it. See the difference? You're going to minimize maintenance. That's what committees do. Take care of the organization. So you can maximize ministry, which is out there helping people emotionally, physically, spiritually, stuff like that. So ministry meets needs, maintenance takes care of the organization. One of the reasons why more people aren't involved in actual ministry is we've got them too busy in meetings and in maintenance. They're sitting on some flower committee or something like that. Your members only have so much time uh, to give each week. And you need to remember that the most important thing your members give you is not their money. It's their time. It's their time. What men, what men give you their time, time's far more important than money. And if somebody comes to me and goes, Pastor Rick, I've got four hours a week to give my church. I'm not going to turn him into a bureaucrat and put him on a committee. I'm going to give him a ministry that's doing worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, or evangelism. I've got to keep him moving. One of the common mistakes we make in church is we take the brightest and best people and turn them into bureaucrats. And we, we put them on a committee. Now, one of the ways to minimize the maintenance in your church so they have people have more time for ministry, as I said, is reduce meetings. Do you really need all those meetings? I believe that the typical church could cut out half its schedule and it would be healthier. The Bible says, I have come that you might have life. Life must be lived at work and at home, not in a church building. 
not between the walls of the church. So you minimize the number of meetings you have. You might, you'll actually get healthier if you're able to cut back some of those business meetings and committee meetings and stuff like that. Don't expect everybody to be at everything. You know, sometimes we act like we rate people's spirituality on how many meetings they attend. If you come to Sunday morning, you're a good Christian. Uh, if you come back for another service, you're a great Christian. And if you're involved in a third Bible study, you're a super Christian. As if Jesus said, you have to come to meetings. He didn't. As I said, at Saddleback, we don't have any committees, but we have over 500 different ministries, and they work whenever they can work. Now, the biggest complainers in your church are going to be people on a committee with nothing to do. And, and, and I said this yesterday, when you're all rowing the boat, you don't have time to rock it. And what I've found is the biggest complainers in the church are not the people doing the ministry. The people who are doing the ministry are very fulfilled. They're working with kids, they're working with students, they're working with uh, you know, veterans, they're working with Celebrate Recovery, they're working with the mentally ill, they're, working, they're doing ministry, they're very fulfilled. It's the people who are on the boards and the committees who are the complainers. Because it's all internal maintenance stuff. And, and so uh, maintenance is not fulfilling, ministry is. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, that, that actually the pastors are called to take care of the maintenance so that the members get to do the ministry. Now number four, here's a key, key one. Provide on the job training. Provide on the job training. We, we call this uh, our leadership community uh, and you've got to figure out how you're going to train your core. We used to do it with a monthly meeting called SALT, Saddleback Advanced Leadership Training. It was a monthly rally for everybody in our core. If your church can do that, God bless you. But we're finding it's hard to even, with all the other stuff we've got going on, even to do that on a monthly basis. But now we have technology where you can train people through videos and you can train people through uh, you know, online and you can train people through long distance and you can train people lots of different ways. Rather, It used to be the only way you could train was have a meeting for it. But that's not true anymore. You can give people a book, you can give them a, a pamphlet, a, uh, you can them give them a, 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 an MP3 to listen to. There are lots of ways to train, but you provide on-the-job training. Now here's what I'm saying about this. Most churches, or a lot of churches, what they do is they say, well, we've got to have trained leaders. Well, of course you do. But what we do is a minimum of pre-service training, that's before you start, minimum of that, and then for the rest of your life, you're in the rest of your life training. It's on-the-job training is better than pre-service training. A person who will sign up for six months or six weeks of training before they start, we probably don't want because they're a professional student. What I tell people is just, just start serving. You don't have to know anything, just start serving. You don't even know the questions to ask till you start serving. And you get involved in this ministry and you go, well, what about this? Well, now I'd like to teach you how to do that. And they're much more teachable. Never in, in, in remember, this is all built on the model of Jesus. Jesus never says, today is day 52, we're covering this. No. Uh, he, what he'd do is he'd say, get in the boat, let's go to the other side of the lake. He'd fall asleep, let a storm come up. They're scared to death. He goes, now we're going to learn about faith today, folks. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it was on-the-job training. It wasn't like, I'm going to teach all this knowledge, and then you're going to go do it. Because you know what? When you're teaching all this knowledge, they're going to forget it all. It, it, you give them too much too soon. And so we believe in minimum pre-service training. Just get started in ministry. Start working in that uh, backpacking ministry. Start working in that homeless shelter ministry. Start working in our motel ministry. Just start working. And then we'll give you training on the job. And uh, we, we do that. Just don't wear people out with pre-service training. Uh, number five, never start a ministry without a minister. Never start a ministry without a minister. And what I mean by that is, what we do in typical church is we'll think up a job or a ministry we want, and then we go try to fill that position. No, wait until you have the person first before you start the ministry. Never start a ministry without a minister. The most critical factor in a new ministry, let's say we're going to start uh, a ministry to people with HIV. The most critical factor is not the idea, 
But the most critical factor in a ministry is the leadership. You got the right leader, it's going to work. You got the wrong leader, it's not going to work. No matter how much your community needs that ministry with the wrong leader, it's not going to work. So without the right leader, it won't fly, it won't float, it could do more harm than good. Everything rises or falls on leadership. So what am I telling you? That when you want to start a ministry, you go, we really, well, first, maybe you have a lot of military in your area. We really need a, a military ministry. We need a veterans ministry. We need a, a, a ministry to spouses whose uh, spouse are on deployment. Well, you can see it, in this, but if you don't have the leader, it's not the time to start it. It won't fly, it won't float, the wrong leader uh, won't, won't make it happen. The idea is good, but more important is, do we have the leader? Never start a ministry without a minister. So you trust God's timing, you never force a ministry, you be patient, you wait on God's timing, you try not to get in a hurry and set up a ministry. If you, if you start ministries and then try to fill it, you're pushing people in the ministry. And when you push people, now you've got a motivation problem. And if you have to push them to get into it, you have to push them to stay in it. And then you end up pushing people all the time. I heard about a pastor who uh, every Monday morning would go down and watch the train go by in his little town. And he said, why do you do that? He goes, it's the one thing I don't have to push. <laughs> and, and, and that's why you get tired. If you're having to push every ministry to work, then you're, you're going to get tired. Let people gravitate toward their interests. That's the whole idea of shape. Spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, experiences. That if I'm shaped to do something, I'm going to want to do it. If I'm not shaped to do it, I'm not going to want to do it. But if I'm shaped to do it, if I'm doing something and I'm shaped to do it, it expresses my shape, I like doing it. You don't have to motivate me. Uh, of these people who are involved in over 500 ministries at Saddleback, you know how many of them I motivate? None. None. Why? Because they're shaped to do that. And so they get the fulfillment from, I'm expressing what God made me to be. I'm an artist. I'm a musician. Uh, I, I'm good with kids. I'm good with mechanics. I'm good with cars. I'm, I'm a translator. I'm good at this. It's what I was wired to do. So when a gifted person comes along, then we start the ministry. But if there's no interest, then, then we don't sweat it. Where'd you get that idea, Rick? Book of Acts. The book of Acts is always playing catch up uh, with organization. They didn't organize anything and then ask God to bless it in the book of Acts. It's the, a problem comes up, and uh, you know, these women over here, the Greek women aren't getting what the, the Jewish women are getting. We, we need to solve this problem of the, the poverty and the distribution of food, and, and some guys show up, and you always organize after the fact. The Holy Spirit moves, then you organize around it. You don't organize it and ask the Holy Spirit to come in. Make sense? It's a different format. Now, you might want to write this down. Most churches do too, most particularly smaller churches, do mu too much too soon. And that's one of the dangers of coming to a conference like this. Don't try to go home and run our playbook and do everything we're doing. It, I didn't do it the first 10 years. I, what you're seeing in this church took me 40 years, friends. We weren't doing everything, and there's still stuff. There are big holes at Saddleback Church. Big, giant, gaping holes of ministries we should be doing. But we haven't got there yet. Why? You just can't do everything. And it's a lot of false guilt when you go and go, well, we're not doing that. We, well, when, how do you know you're supposed to be doing it? God brings a leader. God, God never start a ministry without a minister. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither are churches. Uh, number six, establish minimum standards and guidelines. And don't bury your ministries with procedures or committees. Establish minimum standards and guidelines for each of your ministries, and don't bury them with procedures and a long committee. You have to think through some basic ministry standards because best intentions aren't enough. People have good intentions, but when working with people, you have to have some standards. And we have a ministry uh, profile manual that gives a job description for these different ministries. But you think or through the minimum, I keep saying minimum, results expected so you can have a review. What am I saying is when people are called to a ministry, trust them to run it. 
without a lot of interference. Now, everybody look up here because this is one of the most important things I'll say in this session. In your church, you're going to have to decide whether you want to structure. That means organize. You have to decide whether you're going to structure your church for growth or for control. You can't have both. If you want your church to grow, then you have to let it grow. If you try to control it all, it's not going to grow. You've got to decide, are we going to organize for control with a bunch of boards and committees and you know, reviews, or are we going to organize for growth, which means we're going to let it happen, and even if some stuff happens that's not really that good, at least stuff and something's happening. Are we structuring for control or for growth? What is the book of Acts structured for, control or growth? It's structured for growth. Spontaneous, expansive, explosive, exponential growth. You can't have both. So at the Saddleback Church, um, in class 301, anybody who graduates from that class, anybody who graduates from that class can start a new ministry. As long as they follow four guidelines. We have four minimum guidelines in this church. If you're going to start a ministry, these are the four. It's not 25 guidelines. It's four guidelines that you have to follow. That's minimum guidelines. And the first guideline is you don't expect the staff to run it. Okay? So people come up with a ministry idea and they'll say, uh, Pastor Rick, you know, we really need to start this ministry. And I'll go, what do you mean we, Kimasabi? <laughs> uh, I've got my job. I know what I'm doing. Uh, this is calling passing the monkey over to me. Okay, this is reverse delegation. We need, well, are you going to do it? No, well, then we're not going to do it. Uh, and so when you say we, no, 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 it, it's going to be you. I, I remember one time um, there were some people who came and before we had the peace center, people said, well, we really need to be taking care of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the homeless. And, uh, and a lady came up to me and she said, you know, I saw this guy the other day on the side of the street, and he looked homeless, and I, for some reason I just stopped, and I said, what can I do? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and he goes, I'm flat broke, and I don't have any money to get back there, uh, but I, I am, um, uh, I, I'm just you know, living off the charity of people. And so she said, you know, I, I took that guy, and I, I, I got him, I stopped at like a Burger King, bought him a hamburger, and then I got him to a bus ticket, and I, uh, and I got him an overnight motel so he could get on the bus and go back, back home the next day. She goes, Pastor Rick, I think the church ought to do something about people like this. I said, ma'am, sounds like the church did. <laughs> uh, okay? <laughs> Who's the church? You're the church. You're the bus. So I got up the next week and I said, I release all of you to feed the poor and clothe and help the sick. Go, go, just do, and you don't even have to tell me. Just go do it, okay? That's called liberating the laity, all right? You're, you're it. God bless you. You don't expect the staff to run it, okay? Number two, the second guideline is the ministry must be compatible with our church's culture and our goals and our strategy. Does it fit? Is it something, we, you know, we do, that we would do here that it actually fits our, our job? Look, this is not a political church. We don't do anything political. We, we stay apolitical. So we're not going to do any kind of political thing. That doesn't fit our culture. Uh, number three, the third guideline is the ministry will not harm the testimony of our church. We're not going to have nude beast evangelism. Okay? Uh, failure is one thing. Failure that damages the church is another. Uh, and number four is you can start, anyone can start a ministry as long as you don't do any fundraising. Now, the reason we don't let any of the ministries do fundraising is that we say, if you need money, you submit it to, to staff for budget consideration, we'll, we'll put you in the budget. You can't have a unified church without a unified budget. And if you let every ministry solicit funds directly, then your people are going to be overwhelmed with financial appeals, and competition for funding will divide your church, and the best marketing ministry, marketed ministry, is gets the money, not the most important ministry, and it will hurt your core ministries because people like these little sexy things on the side and your key ministries like children's ministry and student ministry and worship ministry, uh, these things then get sidelined by something that sounds real sexy. So you can't have a unified church without a unified budget. Now, if a new ministry proposal, somebody comes and takes class 301 and they go, I've always wanted to do this ministry. 
Um, and, 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 they, they, and they meet all four of these conditions. It's only four. Uh, then we assign them a ministry startup coach who can take them through a 12-step process, which is available to you. Now, there are two kinds of ministry in your churches, in your church. You have core ministries and you have target ministries. Under, everybody understand this. The core ministries are the ministries of your church that you're going to do whether anybody feels called to them or not. Like, we're, we're going to have worship, okay? And we're going to have children's ministry. We're going to have a student ministry because these are com a core ministries of our church. If somebody comes along and says, I want to start a ministry to a particular target group, uh, this group of people, uh, to CEOs. Well, that's a, good, that's a great idea. Or to farmers, that's a great idea. Or, or to a particular, to widows, great idea. Now, widows would be a core because the Bible commands that one. But, but, um, but you say, I'm going to start a CEO ministry. That would be what we call a target ministry. And what we say is, you're free to start that, but it's not going to be the tail that wags the dog in the church. And, and as long as you meet these four conditions... Um, uh, great, but we're not, we, we, it doesn't get as much emphasis as, for instance, student ministry uh, or something, something like that. So your target, your, your core ministries are ministries that your church has to have in order to fulfill its purposes. Examples of that are small groups. That's a core ministry. We're going to promote small groups. Hospitality, music, campus maintenance. Uh, and and they, they, they get budget money. Target ministries are created by individual members who are called to minister to a narrow group of people, and they're led by volunteers and often require little or maybe even no funding at all. And that's when I say we've got over 500 ministries. A lot of those are target. Maybe uh, 40 of them are, are what we call core ministries. Now, remember in the previous session I said everybody wants to feel needed? Well, one of the huge reasons for Saddleback Stroh is we, people feel needed when, they're, when they are allowed to be creative. Seatbelt, remember? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. First Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit in, in all of them. Now, we at Saddleback, when it comes to lay ministries, to the ministries of people, we use what we call <coughs> the your it principle. Somebody goes, Pastor Rick, uh, <coughs> we, we need a ministry to, uh, well, let me just go back and say, bikers, great, you're it. But me, moi, yeah, yeah, you got the idea, well, then, then you're it. People go, well, I, I, I'm not a leader. I just had the idea of having a ministry to bikers, and I like to ride bikes. Well, I tell you what, here's what we do. We'll announce it. Uh, we'll let people know that we're forming a bikers ministry to bikers, and uh, you have an organizational meeting, and you pray that in that first meeting, a leader shows up. <laughs> because if they don't, guess what? You're it, <laughs> exactly, you're it, you're it, you're it. And most of those 500 ministries started that way. People came to me and said, Pastor Rick, we need a prayer ministry. Great, you're it. People, we need a, Pastor Rick, we need a cancer ministry. Great, you're it. Pastor Rick, we need a, 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 an in, internet ministry. Great, you're it. Uh, we need a mental health, and, great, you're it. We need an arts ministry. Great, you're it. And, and each of those were founded on the passion and the shape of people who were there. Celebrate Recovery started with a year at John Baker came to me and uh, sent me an 11-page letter. And uh, great, John, you're it. Here we go. I'll, I'll help you with it. Now, <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes you, somebody comes with you in ministry idea. You say, that's a great idea. In your mind, you're going, there's no way they're going to take carry this one off. <laughs> they don't have the leadership skills to make this thing happen. There's just no way. It's a great idea. No way. So what you do is you get on your knees and you pray that a leader will show up for that. Because sometimes that does happen. Somebody comes up with the idea, but a more qualified uh, leader will actually lead that ministry. Why doesn't the church have more <coughs> power in the world today? If we say one out of three people on the planet is a Christian, why isn't the church having a greater impact? And, and the answer is today is because churches are so structured that people have to go out the ch outside of the church to start their ministry. They have to go outside of the church. They get an idea, and the, and, and the church and the pastor goes, well, we couldn't do that here. 
So they go out and they form Joe Blow Ministry outside and they form a 501c3. That is an American concept. It's not a New Testament concept. In the first 2,000 years of the church, 100% of the ministries were done in, through, by, for local churches. You have to create an umbrella like we have at Saddleback where people can stay in the church and run their ministry without having to go out and form a 501c3. And you say, look, we'll give you uh, copiers and we'll give you all of the stuff that you need. We'll give you promotional support. We'll, 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 you know, we'll help you out. What do you need? We've got, we've got staff and we've got volunteers out there on your own. You're by yourself. Then you've got to raise money and you're tight. And you know. So all of these like 500 ministries, they could have gone out. Every one of those members could have gone out and said, I'm going to start a shoes for the shoeless ministry or, or whatever. And what happens is they go out there. Then who gets the credit? Not the church, but some local, some local name. We believe the glory goes to the bride. I tell uh, guys who are getting married, um, who are you know uh, getting ready to to uh, have a wedding. I say, now you'll have a happy wedding, groom, if you understand that in every wedding the star of the show is the bride. The co-star is the mother of the bride. <laughs> okay, not you. Okay, everybody else is supporting cast. If you understand that, you'll have a happy wedding. You are not the star of this show, guy, all right? It's your bride-to-be and her mom, all right? Now, the bride always gets the glory. And the problem with all these 501c3s is there's a brain drain going out of the church to do their ministry, and the glory is going to all these 501c3s instead of they're going, well, the church never does anything for us. That is a heresy of the 20th century. There are now 45,501 501c3s. That's these independent little ministry groups, nonprofit groups in just the United States alone. It's a Western concept. One time we were in England and Kay and I were teaching there in a conference, PDC conference, and it was in Nottingham where Robin Hood was. You know who Robin Hood is. I mean, every American boy grew up on Robin Hood, the stories of, you know, rob from the rich and give to the poor. And so I said, I got to go over to the sheriff of Nottingham's castle and see the statue to Robin Hood. So we go over there and we see that. And then we go down into this old castle. It's a thousand years old. And there was a a, a setup, a display of what life was like in 1000 AD in England. And I took a picture of the poster and it said, in 1000, 1000 AD, the church was the center of the community. It trained the artisans, it educated the children, it cared for the poor, it healed and helped and cared for the sick, uh, it educated uh, the next generation. It was all the things that we, the church should be doing. And you know what's happened in the last 100 years? We've delegated that from the church to government and to 501c3s or nonprofit businesses. This bothers me that the glory is not going to the body of Christ. When Katrina, do you remember that big hurricane? When Katrina hit in America a number of years ago, and I stood up on Sunday morning, we had over 6,000 churches in our network, in the Purpose Driven Network, that were in the path of that hurricane. 400 of those churches totally lost their buildings, wiped out by the hurricane, 400. Most of them were small, rural, African-American churches. I stood up on Sunday morning and just about 30 seconds said, guys, we gotta help these people. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And on that morning, we took up an offering in cash of $1.7 million. I got on a plane, and the next day, Kay and I and several of our staff went to four locations in the South, in Louisiana and, and uh, Texas and, and the other states, Alabama, that they were all hurt. And we went to purpose-driven churches, brought the pastors in, divided up the money, and said, here, we're going to help you. Our church paid the salaries of those 400 pastors who lost their buildings. And we said, look, uh, you've lost your members. They've gone to Memphis or Houston. Uh, you lost your building. You probably lost your own home. But you know that your little community better than anybody else. So we're going to pay you to stay. And we paid those pastors during the next year. Some of them four months, some six, some eight months, some for an entire year. 
And at one point, well, we said, you need a vacation, and we flew them all out here to come to a PDC conference and said, go to the beach and just have some fun. Now, that's the body ministering to the body, help, helping each other, okay? We have... We may be the only church in America that has had on staff a pastor of disaster, <laughs> but, but that we have had 30, we've been involved in 34 national and international disasters, and now it's so much that if you have a disaster in your area, obviously you call us, because we know how to mobilize not just our church, but a whole network. When, when, when the floods happened in, um, in um, Houston, and we took up a big offering and went down there, went to Carrie and Chris's uh, place, and we went to different places down there, and I met with about 500 pastors. And other churches were writing to us. Uh, Robert Morris, the well-known pastor in Dallas, sent Saddleback 100 grand. He goes, you guys know how to do disaster better than we do. Make sure it gets to the right place. And, and so we did. But then we had churches like your church, a church from Oklahoma, uh, has, you know, uh, 200 people, and they said, we want to help. Well, we said, we're, we'll put you with this church. So we're now a job placement for disasters okay so if your church wants to help in a disaster the next major disaster call us <laughs> all you got to call and you just call ghostbusters <laughs> and, and 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 that way we take care of each other then the anyway while i was there the reason i was going to tell you the story is while i was in katrina i was in baton rouge and i went over and i met with the head of the red cross and then this giant disaster. And I asked the head of the Red Cross, how many volunteers do you have working for you? And she told me 19,000 volunteers are working for Red Cross. I go, is that all? I said, the Southern Baptist men of Texas alone since 26,000 men into Katrina. One denomination, one group. Southern Baptist men of Texas alone sent 26,000 men to the disaster area to work in Katrina. I go, you only got 19,000, 18, 19,000? I said, let me ask you this. How many of your Red Cross workers are church members? She said, oh, 100%. I said, then why are you getting the credit? Because it's the church that's doing this. It's not the Red Cross. I am jealous for the glory of the church. I want the glory to go to the bride. I want your church to get the credit. Okay, And so I'm in the next session, you're going to hear me say, out, stop outsourcing your missions. I'm telling you today, stop outsourcing your ministry and having somebody else do it and get the credit when it's your people doing the work. You got people who are volunteering for all kinds of stuff in your community who could be doing it in the name of Christ. Don't want to get on to that much longer, but. Okay, number, number seven. Allow people to quit or change ministries without guilt. Allow people to quit or change ministries without guilt. Now, at Saddleback, when people sign up for a ministry, we encourage uh, a one-year commitment. But we don't, endorse, uh, don't enforce it. And, and we don't lay on a guilt trip or shame people when they want to change a ministry. You know, in the average church, uh, to resign from a ministry, yeah, you've got to die. Uh, <laughs> or quit and feel guilty, uh, or move to another church. Uh, I, I, sometimes people just need time off. And, and so you have replacements. A woman who leaves junior high ministry after 10 years should not be criticized. She should be enshrined as a saint. <laughs> and not made to feel guilty that she served for 10 years with junior high and now wants to do something else. So we don't lock people in permanently in a ministry. We allow them to change ministries or without fear or embarrassment. You want to give your people, write this down, the freedom to do three things. You want to give your people the freedom to do three things. Examine, experiment, and exercise. Examine, experiment, and exercise. First, you want to examine. You give them the freedom to examine all the ministries of your church. You want to be a Sunday school teacher? Uh, you want you want to you want to help with the choir ministry. You want to help with this. You want to you want to you know work with uh, orphan care. You you want to help us start a new ministry to uh, after school kids. Wh whatever you give them a chance to examine all the ministry options and possibilities, and then you give them a chance to experiment. The only way you're going to know what you're good at is you just try it. And so you let people try. Well, I'll work in children's ministry for a while, and you go, hey, this really is me. 
or no, this is really not me. Okay? And, and you just experiment. You never call it a failure. You call it an experiment. You got to try five or six ministries and find the one that, man, I really feel good here. Sometimes they'll bomb out in one ministry and then really excel in another. And then exercise means to exercise your, your spiritual gifts. Um, now, this is why I don't really believe in these spiritual gift tests so much. Um, because you don't really know what you're good at unless you've tried it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I remember when I was a kid, the big rage was take this spiritual gift test, and once you know your gift, then you'll know what your ministry is. Okay? And I took this gift, and of course I hadn't done anything, I was just a teenager, and it, I was really depressed because when I took the spiritual gift test, the only gift it said I had was the gift of martyrdom. <laughs> I'm going, oh, great. That's the gift you only get to do one time, and it's over. And you only get to use it on the last day of your life. <laughs> so I could have taken a thousand spiritual gifts test and never knew I had the gift of teaching. Why? I'd never done it. I'd never done it. And, and when I, the only way I learned I was, I was gifted at teaching was I started doing it, and then when I did it, people go, yeah, you know, Rick, when you, when you talk, it blesses people. Oh, well, maybe I ought to do that. I didn't actually start off. as a preacher. I started off as a worship leader. I, I love music. I have a passion for music. I play guitar. I play drums. In school. I had a rock, a garage band, uh, you know, in school. And we, we I, I've always loved music. So I started off as a worship leader because I love to sing. What I discovered is nobody loved listening to it. <laughs> so I quickly switched from singing to speaking. <laughs> if you don't fit in the ministry, it's no big deal. There's something else for you. Okay, it, it, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't sweat it. You're not supposed to be good at everything. So you experiment. You, try, you don't have to commit to it forever. Take baby steps. And the only way you discover... What I'm just teaching you, again, is the exact opposite of most books. Most books will tell you this. Take a gifts analysis. Learn what your gift is. Then you know what you're good at. You'll know... Here. Like, learn your shape. Then you'll know your ministry. And we say at Saddleback, it's the exact opposite. Get involved in ministry, and you'll discover what you're good at. Get involved in ministry, and you discover your shape. Shape does give you significance, but you learn your shape from ministry. It's not like I'm going to sit in a parked car, and God's going to reveal what I'm good at. No, just start serving. Oh, that's not me. Well, that's not me. That's, oh, that's me. And then you learn your shape, your spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, and experiences. So... They're too standardized, those gift questionnaires. They don't accurately evaluate. And, and the other problem with spiritual gift tests is the more mature you become, the more you start manifesting all the different gifts. For instance, you might not have the gift of giving, but as you become a more mature believer, you get more generous. You may not have the gift of hospitality, but the, the more uh, mature you get, the more nice you are to people. And so actually, the more mature you are, sometimes it's harder to understand what your gift is because a lot of it might just be your character. It's the fruit of the Spirit you're manifesting, not particularly a gift of the Spirit. Does that make sense? All right. So we let them exercise. We never call it a failure. We call it an experiment. Uh, it would be a good idea to, like, at least once a year, have a ministry month where you emphasize every, do a ministry fair after your service. Preach a message on ministry have you ever all the ministry set up? People go out and they visit all of everyone's. They can see where they could try or sign up or experiment. All right? Uh, number eight is provide. I'm going to ask uh, Keith to come and share this. Provide the support needed. Provide the support needed. Thanks, buddy.
provide the sport, the support you needed. And I believe this is our primary job. I really believe as pastors and as staff members, is to provide excellent support for our people and the ministries that they're doing. Ephesians 4 says our responsibility is to equip God's people, right? To do the work of the ministry and build up the church. And there's four different ways that we need to do this. And the first is material support. You gotta make sure that they have access to the things that they need, a copy machine, a computer, phones, internet, space to meet. Don't overlook that. Make sure they have adequate, if you will, material support. They also need communication support. Keep their ministries informed. Keep their ministries informed. This, this is something I really believe. I don't believe that we can ever over-communicate. But we can definitely under-communicate, true? We definitely can do this. So we have to develop ways to communicate to them effectively and continuously and clearly. If people don't know what's going on, they'll eventually not care. If they don't know what's going on, they won't care. I've heard it said, whatever people are not up on, they will eventually be down on. And so we've got to communicate, make sure it's clear, make sure it's consistent. Number three, we need to give them promotional support. Keep their ministries visible. Keep them visible. This is the one thing I love to do. Rick talked about setting up ministry tables, having a ministry fair, at least twice a year. We like to do it, man, three, four times a year. Print a brochure. Set up, if you will, a web page for each of the ministries. Share the wins publicly. This is, by the way, something we do every weekend at the church I pastor. I believe every time you're pastoring and, and you're preaching and you're, and you're helping people understand things, it always has something to do with the ministry going on. And so we're constantly... keeping the wins before people, letting people celebrate. Plan a special event to just honor them. We, we take a page out of Disney called Be Our Guest. And we literally open up with the song, Be Our Guest, Be Our Guest, and uh, put our service to the test. And we have so much fun with it. And one of the things that we like to do is the paid team is we pick up a towel because we think being a paid is a towel, not a title. And we go around and literally wash their feet in every way we can. We just celebrate them, honor them, tell them how great they are. You can't do it enough. By the way, I believe that not only should you do a special event, pastor, I think you need to do it every weekend. There isn't a moment I don't walk through our welcome center. I'm looking for people who are serving other people and telling them thank you. Thank you. I mean, a lot of you know the studies. The people, when they decide they're going to come back to that church, it's a whole lot well before they ever get to me. And so we're constantly, even in the service sometimes, just stopping and telling the people that are behind cameras and sound. In fact, I, I just wish you'd do that right now. All the people that are behind the scenes, let them know how much you appreciate them. Man, I can't thank enough. I'm telling you, they're my heroes because they can quickly turn me off. <laughs> and, uh, but I so appreciate them. I go around to our children's ministry and just kind of duck in and just say, man, thank you. I can't thank you enough for everything that you do. Find every way that you can to just promote them, to pat them on the back and say thanks. Which brings me to number four, moral support. Keep them encouraged. Mark Twain once said, I can go two weeks on one good compliment. And the Bible would agree. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, a word of encouragement does wonders. You know, I remember preaching this to our people, and we say it quite often, that if you got up every day and you went to your mailbox or you went to your email, and every day someone reached out and just told you how much they love you and how proud they are of you, I'll guarantee you to change your life. Why don't we? Why don't we take a moment? And so something that I have 
right on top of my desk is a box of cards. And, and i also tell you this. When I get discouraged, the number one way that I get over it is I start thinking of others that I can encourage and give it away. And it's crazy how quickly. And isn't that what the Bible says in Philippians? Think of others more important than yourself. And I just start thinking of ways. And I'm not talking about false flattery. I'm talking about true encouragement. Just saying thank you. Just a card that says how much I appreciate you. I saw you do this. I heard about this. I look through newspapers and, and find things in our local magazine. And when people come up in the church, I just want to reach out and say, hey, I just want to tell you, I read this article. So proud of you. Thanks for everything you do. Find ways to do that. There's three ways, quickly, that you need to do this. Make it real. The Bible says don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. I heard it said once, usually when somebody pats you on the back, they want you to cough something up. How much condition, how much condition is involved in so much when we think it's encouragement? But make it real. Make it real. Make it recognizable. Make sure that they know that you know. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, verse 33, what a joy it is to find just the right word for the right occasion. Find ways to make it recognizable and then make it regular. Man, do it all the time. The Bible says whenever we can, we should always be kind to everyone. I like to tell our people, you know what whenever is? It means right now. Do it regularly. Tell them often. I, I have three, three girls. And uh, if you saw my wife, everybody thinks I have four. And uh, that's another subject. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I tell them every day. I love them. Every day. My girls have never heard me say anything negative to them, no kidding. Every day, without fail, I will reach out. My 24-year-old, she's two years out, and it's so cool uh, that she wanted to work for her daddy. And she does all of our social media. That's what she went to school for. But every day, I find a way to just say, hey, love you. So proud of you. You're so beautiful. Love what God's doing with you. Every day I want to find that. Give it away. Just give it away. Do it regular. By the way, you all know, give people flowers while they're living. <laughs> they don't do much for them when they're dead. Find ways that you can do that. I, I'm a person that doesn't celebrate much of birthdays and anniversaries because I just wonder if I may never get to it. And so I'm just constantly trying to find ways that I can send. Flowers to my wife because every day is an anniversary that God gave me an incredible gift. in her and I find that with my children as well when we get to Christmas we never can get to Christmas to open up Christmas gifts because they're all open before we ever get there and so I was tell my wife we'll just go buy more it's just so fun <laughs> to give it away and you know, science, science has discovered that the healthiest emotion is appreciation. And wouldn't you agree? Nothing.
being appreciated. Find ways. to do it. Pastor Rick? Thanks, Keith. Thanks, buddy. You know, this issue that he's talking about is So important the support. One of the ways you can support the leaders in your churches. Is bring them to conferences like this, and and we have a lot of smaller. Conferences that like at our Rancho Capistrano Retreat Center where you can get additional training. We're on your side. We're here to help you. You know, there are two kinds of hospitals. There are hospitals and teaching hospitals. Hospitals care for the sick. Teaching hospitals, like UCLA Hospital, doesn't just care for the sick, they train doctors. And so when they walk around, the doctors has a group of people, interns with them. That they're training them at the same time. Saddleback is a teaching. We don't just minister to this community, we help train it. other churches and that's part of our goal we want you to succeed we want you to be effective we want you to bear fruit now on lay ministry your you personally your greatest ministry likely come out of your deepest hurt.
never waste a hurt. God never wastes a hurt. And one of the things you can do is, who can, who can better help somebody who's an alcoholic than somebody who's been an alcoholic? Who can better help somebody going through a divorce than somebody who's gone through a divorce? Who can better help somebody who's been, had a miscarriage than someone who had a miscarriage? Who, who can better help someone who was abused as a child? Physically, emotionally, sexually, than some, I'm sorry if you were, I really am. I am. But don't waste your hurt. God can use it. Second Corinthians 1, God go, comforts us in our sorrows so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we've been given. So help your people look at their hurts as possibly their ministries. That that's what it's going to come. I wanted to give you an example of that, and that's why we handed out the Hope for Mental Health community. Most of you know or probably have heard the story that my youngest son, Matthew, took his life six years ago. It was the worst day of my life. I'm not over it. We're, we're not over that. People say, are, are, you, are you over it? You never get over that. You get through it. But you don't get over it. You don't get over a suicide. But he struggled with mental health his entire life. He was the most courageous kid I've ever seen. Every day he'd get up and go to school in pain. One time when he was 17 years old, he came to me and he said, uh, Dad, it's real obvious I'm not going to be healed. He, he knew the Lord. And he goes, we've, we've been to the best doctors. We've had the best therapists. I've taken the most meds. I've had the best prayer warriors praying for me, people in spiritual warfare. You know, he said, Dad, you're a man of faith. Mom's a woman of faith. It's real obvious I'm not going to be healed. Why can't I just die and go to heaven? I know where I'm going. And in tears, that'll break your heart as a father. In tears, I said, oh, Matthew, I, I understand your pain. I don't think you want to die. I think you just want relief. And that's what everybody wants. They want relief. And I said, I have to believe in God and his promises, and I have to believe in hope. And my hope is that one of two things will happen. Either one day, you will be miraculously healed and I don't care if it's medical, medicine, or by miracle. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not picky on how God heals you. <laughs> doesn't matter. If God wants to use doctors, great, fine. That you... will be healed. But, Matthew, this is not heaven. This is earth. And not everything gets healed on this earth. And there's a lot of problems on this earth. And some things, what do you do with a, a chronic problem? There's some things in your life that are never going to be right. You're in your body, it's just never going to be right or whatever. And what do you do with those things? You have to learn how to manage them for the glory of God. And my goal is that through medical... and through counsel and wisdom and therapy and whatever, you're able to manage this pain. And one day we are going to be completely set free. He made it 10 more years. He was very courageous in my opinion. Kay and I had always known having a youngest child with mental illness that one day we would be spokesmen for mental illness. But we felt it was Matthew's story to tell. And so we didn't really talk about it a lot until after he was gone. But on the day that he died and we went over to his house and the door was locked and his car was there and we hadn't seen him in 24 hours and we were, we were worried about him because that was very unusual. The night before he'd actually been at our house, we had dinner together, watching TV and played and was just hanging out. And we had no problem in our relationship on that part. In fact, as he was leaving, he just said, Dad, I'm so tired. I'm, I'm so tired. We went home, and when we went over to his house and we're waiting for the police to come and break down the door, that what we've always feared might happen and what we would prayed would never happen, happened. As I stood there, in that driveway. I 
hugging my wife, and we were both sobbing, sobbing. And Kay reached down, and she had a necklace on with two words that were the words of a book that she had written. Choose joy. And I said, how do you, she held it up, I said, how do you choose joy when your heart is breaking in a thousand thousand pieces? I probably wouldn't be in ministry today if it weren't for a small group and the love of this church. But they loved me. And that night, our small group all came over to our house and they said, we're not leaving you alone. We're not leaving you alone. We're going to stay. We're going to sleep here. And they slept on the couches and they slept in the kitchen and wherever they could. We're just going to be with you. They didn't come to preach a sermon. Let me give you a principle of pastoral care. The deeper the pain, the fewer words you use. If your friend's having a bad heart, uh, hair day, you can talk to it about 30 minutes. But if you have someone who just lost a kid, kid to suicide, show up and shut up. You, people go, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just show up. Show up. It is the ministry of presence. Just be there in people's pain. There's nothing you can say that will make it better. Nothing you can say. Just show up and shut up. Just be the ministry of presence. Be the ministry of Christ. For the next six weeks, 16 weeks, I didn't preach. I, I, I didn't preach a single service. Um, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't have a staff meeting. I, I didn't come to church. It was just too much pain. I pretty much spent 12 hours a day alone with God. Okay. Now you can't spend 16 weeks all day alone with God, okay, <laughs> and it not change you. Unfortunately, it didn't change all my personality quirks. But I am a different man. And, and I'm much more sensitive to the pain of other people than I've ever been. Uh, you were given... ...today a hope for mental health community. I, I wanted to give this to you as an example of... A ministry that's starts out of pain. This is a manual for how to start a mental health ministry in your church. You could do this in a very small church. You could do this. 60 million people in America struggle with mental health. That means everybody here knows somebody. In fact, it's in our families, and we know that. And one of the things the church has to do is remove the stigma from mental health. It is not a sin to be sick. All right, now listen. If your heart doesn't work right and you take a pill for your heart, heart, no shame in that. If your stomach doesn't work right, your spleen, you got diabetes, you take a pill for that, no shame in that. If your back goes out and it doesn't work right, you take a pill for that or lung, no shame in that. Why if, if my brain isn't working right and I take a pill for that, I'm supposed to keep it a secret? It's just an organ. Folks, we're all mentally ill. 
You, every one of you have compulsions. Every one of you have fears. Every one of you, some of you have an anger management issue. Some of you have a fear issue. Some of you have uh, anxiety issues. Everybody, have you noticed your body's broken? Because everything on planet Earth is broken. So what you need to say to the person next to you is, I'm broken, but I'm not crazy. Okay? I'm broken, but I'm not crazy. Now, now, let me tell you. Every person in this room has at some point thought, am I losing my mind? Am I going crazy? Let me tell you real clearly, you're not crazy. Why? Because crazy people don't worry about it. <laughs> the very fact that you're anxious and scared and worried means you're not. But you are deeply broken. You're incredibly valuable and you're deeply flawed. And both of those things are true about your life. And the sooner you get honest about both, the sooner, the healthier you'll get. I'm deeply flawed. And if my bone back doesn't work right, I go to a back doctor. And if my brain doesn't work right, I go to a brain doctor. And I get some help on that. And the church should be leading the way. The church should be leading the way in the... anti-rise of racism. The church should be leading the way in the Me Too movement, and the church should be leading the way in mental health. These are three big issues in our society right now. All right, we got five minutes for me to cover 30 minutes of material. You have gotta write really fast. Number nine, in building a ministry core, delegate authority with responsibility. Delegate authority with responsibility. Let me give a word to everybody here who's a deacon or an elder or a church council or a pastor. If you really want your church to explode with growth, you must trust people. And, and, and I will say, let other people, pastors, let other people make some of the mistakes. Don't hog them all yourself. <laughs> I want, other, I want to spread the blame around in this church. I don't want to be the only one making all the mistakes because I, I do. So I want you making some, then I'll feel a little bit better about me. You know, so many churches are afraid of wildfire. They run around putting out every little camp fire that will warm the church up. If we would just trust people and turn them loose to minister without a lot of policies and procedures and controls and committees, we'd see some actions. <laughs> this will shock you. What do these words have in common? Vote, voting, elections, majority rule, parliamentary procedure, committees, boards, board meetings, Voting. What do those words have in common? None of them are in the Bible. And yet, how many churches that you know are run by those things? What we've done is we've taken an American form of government and imposed it on the church, and then the church is as effective. There's the government. Uh oh. The church is not a business, it's a family, it's a flock. It is not an organization, it is an organism.
Now, what I'm telling you is that you got to let, you got to trust people. I wanna, let me give you some lessons we've learned here. over the 39 years of Saddleback. Number one is that the key to keeping lay ministers motivated is to give them ownership.
As much as possible, we let every ministry make their own decision. The implementers are the decision makers. If you're in children's ministry, you make the decisions about cribs. And if you're in youth ministry, you make the decision about where you're going to camp. And if you're in whatever ministry, and you make the decision. People ask me all the time, say, how do you try to control it? I say, I can't. I don't. It's not my job to control the church. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So as much as possible, the staff, the pastors, stay out of the decision-making of each ministry. Second thing I've learned is this. People respond to responsibility. They step up their game when you trust them. People respond to responsibility. But if you trust your people, if, if you treat your people like babies, you're going to have to diaper them the rest of your life. <laughs> Let them grow up. Let them grow up. People respond to responsibility. The third thing I've learned is that people will be as creative as the structure allows them to be. And I've seen this in thousands of churches. The problem in a lot of churches is that the pastor and the board can become a bottleneck. Everything has to pass through the board. And, you know, I always try to make my initial reaction to uh, any, any, any minister ideas. Why not? Why not? Um, hey, pastor, we got a great idea. Well, why not? Let's try it. Now, sometimes I've heard an idea 16 times. And it's been tried nine, and every one of them failed. But I'm very reticent to tell somebody it's not going to work. They may, might, might just be the person to make it work. I'd rather have them find out on their own than me tell them, oh, I've seen that 16 times. That's never going to work. <laughs> you know, if you keep popping people's balloon, pretty soon they come, stop coming up with ideas. They, they just, well, it's, it's the doctor knows, the pastor so I've seen that before. Uh, and enth- well, the reason why enthusiasm ebbs in a lot of uh, churches is because they say, well, we've never done it that way, or we've always done it this way. And then enthusiasm ebbs. I'm very hesitant to tell somebody it's not going to work. And as I said, sometimes somebody comes up with an idea. They, they, you, you have a ministry planning initial meeting. Are we going to start this ministry? And... You know that this person is not a leader, but a good leader shows up, and then you go back home and you go, thank you, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, how do you bring out the best in people? You bring out the best in people three ways. Write these down. You give them a challenge, you give them control, and you give them the credit. You give them a challenge, that brings out the best in others. I believe you can do this. You give them control, you give them credit. For growth to happen, You've got to have these three things. Give people challenge, give them control, and give them credit. Now, what I'm about to say is the second most important thing I'll say in this session, and it is this. For growth to happen, both the people and the pastor must give up control. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. It's very important. The pastor must give up control of the ministry and the people must give up control of the leadership. No great church has ever been led by a committee. When when you have more than one vision, as I said, you have division. For growth to happen, the people and the pastor must both give up control, but they have to give up control of different things. The pastor has to give up control of the ministry. Of those 50,000 people baptized, you think I baptized them all? Of course not. I had to give up control of the ministry. There are a lot of things that I love to do as a pastor. I don't get to do anymore simply because of the size of our church. It's like a city. The pastor gives up control of the ministry, let the people do it. People give up control of leadership, let the pastor do it. You know, I'll tell you this story. One day, this is many years ago, there was a guy, and I had told our people one day, I said, look, guys, uh, I, I, on a Wednesday night service, we had a Wednesday night service, I said, guys, I'm burning out. We only had like 300 people at the time. 
and I'm, I'm, go, I'm burning out. I'm doing all the preaching. I'm doing all the teaching. I'm doing all the praying. I'm doing all the baptizing. I'm doing all the hospital visits. I'm doing all the weddings, I'm doing all the funerals. I'm doing all the counseling. I can't keep up. And it's obvious that our church is on a trajectory to grow. And I'm going to be the bottleneck if I have to do all the ministry. I can't do this anymore. I'll burn out. But I said, as I read the Bible, it's not my job to do the ministry. Ephesians 4 says, pastors are to equip the saints for their work of ministry. In that verse, the pastors are the equippers and the saints are the doers. The, the members are the ministers. The pastor is the administer. It is not my job to do the ministry. It's, one, it's not a one-man show. It's your job to do the ministry of this church. It's my job to make sure you succeed at it, to coach you, to administer, to help, to block and tackle for you, for your ministry. And so I said that night to our people, I'll make you a deal. If you people will do the ministry of this church, I will make sure you're well fed. And I will pray and I will serve and I will study and I'll, I'll give you the best food I, I've got to help you be strong in your ministry. If you'll do the ministry, I'll help you get there and do your ministry. And the people said, Pastor Rick, you got a deal? We shook hands on it, we signed the covenant, and the church exploded with growth. Because I was no longer the bottleneck. I, I told you, I, I've been away, at one point I was away writing a book, seven months, and the church grew by 800 people while I was gone. Because it's not personality driven. It's built on the ministry of every believer. About six months after that happened, uh, there was a guy who had, uh, had a heart attack and he was in the hospital. And he was a charter member. His name was Walt Stevens. So I said, I'll go see Walt. Now, I don't get to go visit everybody in our hospital visit anymore. I mean, imagine, I could be in a hospital all week. If you have, if you have 120,000 names on a church roll, how many people will be in the hospital that week? A lot. A lot. So I can't visit everybody in the hospital anymore. But I said, I know this guy. I'll go, I'll go visit uh, uh, Walt. When I walked into the intensive care, I said, hi, I'm Pastor Rick from Saddleback. I'm here to see Walt Stevens. And the nurse looks up and goes, how many pastors does this church have? <laughs> and I, I go, well, I, I, and at the time, I said, if, if you're talking about full-time ordained, I think we got, I don't know, three, maybe four uh, uh, pastors. But I said, if you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, small group leaders who do pastoral care, uh, you know, we got, we got 100 of those who, who do that kind of pastoral care. She goes, uh, well, I'm sorry, you can't see him. Too many pastors have already seen him. <laughs> now I'm laughing at this. I think this is funny. I said, excuse me, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the pastor. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the head honcho. <laughs> I'm the big wapabanga. I'm the senior, I'm the founding pastor. <laughs> she goes, I don't care how many, what you are, you can't see him. <laughs> now, I think this is really funny. She won't let me in to see this member. So um, she walks away, and I snuck in anyway. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I always say it's easy to get forgiveness and permission. <laughs> Kay hates it when I say that because the kids use it all the time growing up. <laughs> Dad said it's easy to get forgiveness and permission. So I walked in there, and Walt's got all these IVs in his arms, and he's under a tent, and he sits up in bed. He goes, Pastor Rick. What are you doing here? Like, man, I must be really sick. The big guy's here. Okay. <laughs> he goes, I, I didn't know. John Bassanio, pastor of First Baptist Houston, a little old lady said, Pastor John, when are you going to come visit me? He said, ma'am, you don't want to be that ill. <laughs> hey, pastor Rick, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I just came in to pray for you. And, you know, and uh, so I, 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 he didn't need to see me. Nine small group leaders and members had already been to see him doing pastoral care. He didn't need me. I walked out of that room and tears just started coming down my cheeks. And I thought, that is it. That's the way God meant for the church to be. Okay? God never meant the church to be a one-man superstar show where Superman pastor flies in with his cape you know, to the hotel room and sprinkles pixie dust around the bed and hear a prayer, there a prayer, everywhere a prayer, a prayer, and then flies off into the future. And the guy goes, who was that man? And I didn't even get a chance to thank him. You know? and, and we're wearing, of course, we're wearing a mask 
and, but we really want them to know it's us. So we go, it's me, it's me, it's me, you know? And we pull back our chest with a thing that says big S on the chest, which means stupid. Uh, you know, tr trying, to, trying to meet everybody's need. That's a quick way to a grave, to expect your pastor to meet everybody's need. It isn't gonna happen. If your pastor has to meet everybody's needs, you're stuck at 75 people. That's about it. That, that's about, unless he's Superman, then you can go to 150. But uh, 58 times in the New Testament it says, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, and help one another. It is the body ministering to itself. That's what building a core is all about. Would you like your church to be stronger? Would you like your church to grow? One of the biggest barriers to church growth is the misunderstanding of the role of the pastor, thinking that he's supposed to do all the ministry. And it's a misunderstanding by both the members and the pastor. There's no way in the world your pastor can personally meet everybody's needs. So it really boils down to two questions. And I'm gonna ask this question to those of you who are pastors, and I'm gonna ask this question to those of you who are not pastors, and I want you to say, yes, okay? Two pastors, pastor here. Will you give up and release the ministry of your church to members? Yes. All right. And those of you who are members, so are those your members? Will you release your pastor to lead and feed? Yes. Then we got a deal. Okay, we got a deal. All right, number 10. Last, last point, we're out of time, sorry. Always keep the vision before them. Always keep the vision before them. Help people to see that they are investing for eternity. Friends, there is no greater cause than the cause of Christ, the kingdom of God. In every 101 class, and I taught it for nearly 20 years, and Kay taught it for years too, uh, in every 101 class, I would stand up and near the end, I would say something like this. I make no apology in what I'm about to say to you right now. And what I want to say to you is, it may be that the most significant thing you do with your life, in your entire life, is join this church. Obrigado, querido irmão. Sei sim da consideração que você tem por nós, assim como você também sabe a consideração que tem por você, pela sua família, né, por toda a força que vocês têm e estão enfrentando aí. Obrigado pela oração, continue orando sim, aquela famosa crise do sacerdócio quando começa a se decepcionar demais com tudo que vê, mas já está passando, uma depressão que já está passando. Mas também tenho orado por você, Roselio tem me deixado a par dos problemas de saúde que você vem enfrentando, das dificuldades dos das possíveis causas e eu também tenho orado por você, que Deus te abençoe, querido. And you sacrificed, and you had faith, and you built that church. And 25 years after you died, that church led me to Christ. I'm in heaven because of you. Thank you. Do you think that'll be worth it? If you know something more important than to bring people to Christ and build them up to maturity and turn them into ministers and send them out on mission, If you know something more important than that, I invite you to stand up right now and tell us. Because I'm not going to waste my life. And I haven't. I have used my life for what matters most. <laughs> Nothing matters more than the people of God God's people fulfilling God's purposes in God's world through God's church. You can't find anything more significant to do with your life than that. That's, the importance of that truth has to be done over and over and over and over. Here's the problem. We're good forgetters. We get distracted. And what we really forget is what matters most. And we get so involved in programs and events, and stuff, we forget why the church is the church. What you need is what I call the Nehemiah principle, and I'll, I'll end with this. When Nehemiah was commissioned by God to build a wall around the Jerusalem, uh, the Bible says that when they first started, everybody had a lot of energy into it. And that's always true. When you start a church in the plant, there's a lot of energy in the early days. People are excited, and it says they got it all built till the wall was about half built, and then it says the people got discouraged. 
and they were discouraged by four things. I won't teach them. You can go find them in, in Nehemiah 4. But they got discouraged because of four things. Nehemiah didn't say, okay, we're going to give up. We're, we're going to just settle back and be a standard church here. No, he, he, he reorganized it, and he recast a vision, and he told them how to do it differently than they had been doing it. And it says they went ahead and they finished the wall in 56 days. Excuse me, 52 days, 52 days. Now, they built it halfway, it got discouraged, but then they finished it in 52 days. That means vision must be renewed every 26 days. That's the Nehemiah principle. Vision must be renewed every 26 days, which means monthly. Some of you came to this conference full of discouragement and ready to throw in the towel and ready to give up on your church or your ministry or your marriage or your family or your life. And God brought you here to say this to you. Are you listening? Don't you do it. Don't you give up on your life or your marriage or your ministry. We need you to finish well. And I'll talk about that a lot in the last session. I want to introduce, before we close here, uh, a group of men that I have deep, deep admiration for. Um, these are the leaders of the Purpose Driven Peace Board of Rwanda. Fifth, yeah, let's go ahead, Mango. Love you guys. Men and women. Uh, Mary. And remember, when I say guys, I'm including Mary on the end here. So.